Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keene at freekeen.com. Next matter before the court uh, is a matter of uh, Conan Salada. Solid. Solid. Uh, first et al. versus Keene School District. Um, and I'm just going to ask uh, all the plaintiffs to identify themselves. Then I'll ask uh, counsel for the school district to identify themselves as well. So first, if the plans would just stand and identify themselves. Daryl Perry, and I filed a motion to be the attorney in fact for the other co-plaintiffs. And, and, and I'll address that shortly, but I just want to have the other plaintiffs just stand and identify themselves. Sir. Cody uh, Eric Orch. David Crawford. Thank you. I'm the counsel for the, for the school district. Your Honor, I'm, I'm John Wrigley, and I am counsel in the school district. With me is on the far right is Chris Coates. He's the chair of the Key School Board. To my immediate right is Dan Black, who's assistant superintendent of schools. And behind me in the first row is Ruben Duncan, who is also assistant superintendent. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, on, on short notice. Uh, there are really two issues I, I intend to address this morning. But first, let me ask, uh, Attorney Ridley, have you filed an appearance on behalf of the school district? I hope you have. That, I have I filed an appearance and an answer. I, I don't have either. I gave the defendants my extra, or the slants my extra copy. I have it back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. we, absolutely. I, I mailed them all copies. I understand. Sometimes sometimes what happens is people will file things and, and it just takes a couple days for things to get processed through the clerk's office. It's not not uh, not an unusual circumstance uh, to have happen. Um, so so let me let me first start. Not not a problem. Can you do the school? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so the, the first matter I want to address is really uh, the motion that Mr. Perry filed uh, seeking to represent the other co-plaintiffs in the case. Uh, and, and I'll just state for the record that, that the affidavit uh, and, uh, and the materials that we needed to file to comply with the rule appear to be in order. Does the, the school district have any objection to that motion? No objection, Your Honor. That will be granted. Uh, and Mr. Perry can represent the other co-plaintiffs. Uh, in terms of, of the request for, for preliminary injunctive relief, uh, I'll hear argument first from uh, the plaintiff, Mr. Perry, from the address the court. Thank you. The defendants claim that the actions taken taken during the deliberative session were perfectly legal. However, we disagree. There are certain facts that both sides can agree to, that before the deliberative session, seven warrant articles submitted by Conan Soliday and signed by at least 25 voters were filed with the Dean School Board and accepted. During the deliberative session, each of these petitioned articles were amended. Several of the amendment proposals were challenged as being out of order, yet the moderator and school district attorney ruled that the amendments were to be allowed. The school district attorney cited RSA 40, 13, section 4C, said that the amendments did not change the subject matter. However, the RSA states that amendments cannot eliminate the subject matter. A very you know, slight distinction, but a distinction nonetheless. During discussion on one of the amendments, the moderator and attorney acknowledged that there would be no discernible difference between a yes vote and a no vote when the amended articles were voted on next month. This is an admission that the amendment created a nullity, something that RSA 40 colon 13 4 prohibits. Three years ago, there was a case in Rockingham Superior Court Bailey v. Town of Exeter. The judge in that case ruled, quote, the court finds and rules that the only way the phrase no warrant article shall be amended to eliminate the subject matter of the article can be logically read is to conclude 
that any amendment that made the subject matter of the article a nullity was forbidden. And merely because the majority of voters were more clever in the way they amended the amendment was worded to create the nullity does not mean the action was not a violation of the statute. While Bailey is only binding upon those parties, it does have implications for all SB2 jurisdictions, and the opinion in that case can be used by this court as legally persuasive. And I have nothing else at this time, so I will yield to the defense. Thank you, Attorney Rager. And by the way, while, while we're waiting, if, if you want this copy of what you filed, I have uh, the original that was, was actually stamped by the court yesterday at about 11.50 a.m. Please proceed. Your Honor, I don't know how much or how often a town meeting litigation reaches the court. And if you have questions of the mechanics of the two-step procedure for a Midland town meeting, I'll try to answer them. No, I think I think I understand the, the issue, and I've read Judge McHugh's decision in, in the Rockingham County case, and, and it seems to me that that this really is is a, a legal issue before the court whether whether the amendment uh, was uh, consistent with with the, the statute. So I, I think in terms of of that, if you want to focus your argument on that. In that sense, then, then I would begin to say that the New England town meeting is the purest form of democracy. And uh, if Mr. Perry makes fun of cleverness. I, I don't see any cleverness. You make a motion, you have enough people there, you win. If you don't have enough people there that you've convinced them that you're right, you lose. And that's what happened, and that's what's supposed to happen at, at a New England town meeting throw around words like creative and surreptitious and one with syntactic strategy. None of that happened. They also say the moderator ruled and that I ruled. I don't make any rulings. I advised the moderator and advised the school district. But there were no, there was nothing to rule upon. At issue is the wording eliminate the subject matter. I, I can try and distinguish the Exeter case by saying that in, in essence, the, the question in Exeter was, shall the town appoint a budget committee? And, and someone amended it, shall the town not appoint a budget committee? The, the, the distinction makes, you can interpret a vote. In, in our case, each and every of the seven amendments will is advisory, will, pro will provide a significant level of advice to the school board. Uh, each and every budget amendment says shall on a strictly advisory basis so the board spend the lesser amount requested by the petitioners. Um, the board shouldn't take lightly that vote and each one will, will be a significant advisory vote. Nothing was changed to, to make the vote almost nonsensical as in the Exeter case. But, but mostly, I, I, I think the Exeter case was decided wrong. Nullity is not in the statute. To make the, the question advisory does not eliminate the subject matter. It's perfectly consistent. That's what happens at New England town meetings. Uh, the board had several articles on its form, and, and they could have been made advisory too, but the, the voters weren't there to do that. The board had a land purchase article and that could have been changed or made advisory and would have been perfectly acceptable. What, what disturbs me here is of the seven petition articles, only one of them was anything but advisory in the first place. Uh, three of them were budget articles. The warrant is in fact a warning. The board posts its budget. It's required by law to post its budget with the warrant. And the budget is on the agenda for the first session no matter what. We didn't need the three petition articles. I, one of these years I'll take a chance and or probably, I won't take a chance, but you could take a chance. I, I don't know that we needed to post 
their budget articles. The budget article has been warned what their budget article should have been were amendments to our budget article. And they did make those amendments at the meeting, and, and they lost. Um, anything that was changed did not eliminate the subject matter. It, it, it did them more freeze. And, and they talked about a syntactic stratagem. I, I had prepared motions that I was going to ask somebody to amend until this one came out, and they didn't use mine. But mine, maybe that would have been a syntactic stratagem, was to amend their budget articles to the same number the board was going to use. So we would have four of the same budget articles. That would have passed too. What, what we did presents to the district on a more beneficial advisory basis than, than what mine would have done. Um, they're seeing skeletons and ghosts that, that just aren't there. It, it was a New England town meeting the way it should have been run. Um, can, can you address, and I'll certainly whatever argument you want to make, but are you aware, other than, than the, the, the decision, um, the Rockham County decision, are you aware of any other court that has uh, addressed this this question, whether whether uh, an amendment in the, in the time after the statute was amended that has addressed whether the, the propriety of, of an amendment to uh, warrant article uh, in a I'm not aware fashion. of any, Your Honor. And I asked around, and no other school lawyer that I talked to was aware of any. You just stuck with the Exeter case. And your decision well I, I know that that uh, that in the treatise the Laughlin's treatise on uh, local government law there's a discussion of, of this very question and it says it says it kind of points to it as an open and unresolved question uh, in the wake of, of the statute being amended uh, I, so I just was curious as to whether you found anything else no, that's not what you have right. please continue in addition so, so my point is the three budget articles submitted by the petitioners were advisory in the first place and, and they were made advisory by, by the amendments. The next three articles submitted by the petitioners were, were contrary to the law of the state. The, the, the New England town meeting, the, the, the school district meeting, has no authority to overturn a law. The law requires us to put yes and no recommendations in, in the warrant. The, the law requires you to put uh, tax dollar, the, your, your unexpended surplus into the, the tax rolls. The, the law requires, can't be called a third. Uh, the, when there's vacancies on the school board, there's a statute that tells you how to fill them. No matter what, the, the town with the school district, would, the voters would have voted on that petition article. That was advisory only. And the, the argument should have been taken up and conquered. Yeah. Amended or otherwise, everything the petitioners did was advisory except the one. The one was the RSA 198-4B article. And it was reworded, but the, the rewording, that authority is to keep some of your sur unexpended surplus in, in reserve for emergency purposes. It's an authority that the school district has done fine without for 100 years. Last year they approved it, but didn't use it. And uh, the petitioner sought to undo what we did last year. Um, and, and that gets to my point as to irreparable harm. There's no irreparable harm here that requires immediate injunctive relief to stop the election. Again, six of their articles were advisory in the first place. The seventh is something we haven't used for 100 years, only got the right to use it last year, and we won't know whether we're even thinking about using it until we have the budget numbers from June 30th. This case can either be disposed of by June 30th, or at worst, the petitioners can renew their motion on June 1 to, to possibly prevent us from using the, the 198-4D authority. But to stop an election 
is the, the election is critical to the quarterly workings of the school district. We're electing four new board members. The, the budget is an issue. There's a teacher's contract an issue. The, to, to hold the teachers in abeyance, most critically the students, uh, there's a bond issue to uh, do work in our five grammar schools. Um, to have that bond delayed, there's a small window of opportunity to do work in schools. We've coordinated the bond around that. If it's approved, the work will start July 1. Any delay in this election could affect the bond. The bond rates could go up. Construction rates that we have in place could go up. It, it, it's frightening if the remedy is granted that would delay this election. Well, let, let, let me ask a lot to, to pursue that a little further. Uh, again, and, and I'm and I don't mean to suggest anything more than this to this uh, by my question, but uh, if I deny the request for, for preliminary injunctive relief so the election goes forward, but uh, let's say I did have concerns, and again, I'm not, I'm not indicating, I just wanted, because right now it's my understanding the election is set for March 11th. Yes. Uh, but in terms of, of Let's say that I agreed with the, the plaintiffs and that, that what happened was not legally proper. Um, what, 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 what would your argument be about the appropriate course of action? Are you saying, I think I take it you're saying the election should still go forward and then, then because there's no irreparable harm in letting the election go forward on, on March 11th, but uh, we could deal with the remedy and whether uh, something further needed to happen down the road. Certainly can deal with the 198.4b remedy further down the road, namely June 30th. There's plenty of time to address that. The budget. I guess prior to June 30th, you could order by law. I mean, DRA would approve the budget. The <coughs> is determined by the election, I think you would have authority to overturn DRA to use one of their numbers. Hey, again, and I, and I don't mean at all I'm, I'm really getting to the question, because part of the, what the request is, is involves the, the election that's scheduled for, for March 11th, and, and I'm asking uh, whether, and I take what you're saying, is, is that they failed to show irreparable harm with respect to that, the election going forward on, on that date. That, that's the point. And, and I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to address this as well. Yes. And I, I don't think I have any. I, I, would, I would like to provide you with, um, I, I would note the Bailey versus Exeter case refused to grant the injunction that petitioners seek. And, and one of the reasoning is that the ballots have been prepared and the absentee ballots have been sent out. I'd like to give the court a copy of the official ballot. Thank you. And it, perhaps we can just mark this. Uh, it, it, Mr. Perry, have you seen the, the official I ballot? I have not. Yeah. Are these, are these copies of the same document? Yes. Okay, we can be able to mark this as, as uh, exhibit number one. No, exhibit A. Mr. Perry, do you dispute that that's a copy of the official ballot? I do not. I, I have nothing to claim otherwise. I understand. I understand. Please continue. The, the election is in process. The, the workers have been lined up. The two polling places have canceled. One is the rec center. It's canceled whatever the rec center does during the day. The other is the church. It's canceled whatever it does during the day. The, the election workers have got time off work. We're, we're all set for March 11. Uh, absentee ballots have been sent out. Um, it's very, very important that we have our election in time. Uh, the irreparable harm in this case, ironically, belongs to the defendant and the plaintiff. Mr. Perry, if you would, if you would address, again, I, I think I understand the legal issues that both sides have raised uh, on, on, on the question. I'll certainly let you address that. But if you could also address why you, do you, I think you still maintain that 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 your 
you and, and the other plaintiffs will suffer irreparable harm if the election goes forward on March 11th. Is that still your position? Uh, not so much that the election goes forward, but that the election is going forward with illegally amended warrant articles that were put on by petition. The people that are being irreparably harmed are the petition, the people that signed the petition, who, for whatever reason, may not have been able to be at the deliberative session. There's a reason that the RSA says that the right of petitioners to have a warrant article shall not be overturned by RSA 32. And I, I do realize that you know, amending is in RSA 40, so it's technically not being removed from the ballot, but by, by being amended in such a way as to create a nullity, changing the word repeal to ratify and the word remove to ratify I don't see how it can be argued that that does not create a nullity. Irregardless of the legality of the article as petition, we know that municipalities and local jurisdictions pass laws contrary to the RSAs all the time. There's a case pending now where the town of Troy is suing the Monadnock School District because an illegally worded Warren article was placed on the ballot by petition, changing the way that the taxes are allocated in the Nanak School District. So uh, I, I will concede the fact that some of the Warren articles were illegal. I'll concede the fact that some of them could have been worded better. But that is not an excuse to create a legally nullified Warren article to where a yes vote and a no vote have no effect on the uh, official ballot on March 11th. So what I'm arguing is not to postpone or you know, do away with the election, but to either put the petitions as worded on the ballot on March 11th, or hold a second deliberative session at a second date and have a second ballot to where the articles as petitioned can be amended within the confines of the law so that they do not create a nullity. Anything further, Attorney Ray? Your Honor, the notion that 25 voters in a petition article, uh, if I understand the logic, can skip the first session and go immediately to the second session and will eviscerate the first session. Any further response to that, Mr. Perry? There, there are some people who are you know, confined to hospitals that cannot attend the deliberative session, and the only chance that they have to express their opinion is either by petition or on the official ballot. So to, to claim that a petition or an article can be completely eviscerated during the deliberative session, even Though RSA 40, 13, section 4C says that you cannot eliminate the subject. You know, so I, I don't see how they can still argue that changing the word repeal to ratify and the word remove to ratify does not eliminate the subject. Okay, I think I understand the positions of, of everyone. Any further argument on, on the motion? Your Honor, I, I have the minutes, the draft minutes of the first session, as well as the, the DVD of the first session, I don't think you need them for, for the, the injunctive question. Perhaps you want them on the merits. But if, if you want them, you can have them. Well, Mr. Perry, have you seen, have you seen that? The, uh, I have not seen the draft minutes, but I have seen uh, the video. video. Uh, any, any objection to those being submitted to the I was actually considering submitting the video to you myself as evidence. So no objection at all. When we, when we do that, we'll, we'll mark it as, uh, as defense exhibit B for purposes of... And, and the minutes, have you, the draft minutes, have you seen those? I have not. Okay, so what, why don't we do... Uh, I, think, I think the, the video, uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, to the extent there needs to be a record, the actual video um, it sounds like the parties are in agreement that that's the best record of what took place during, during the session. The, the, B, the, the video will be B and, and the minutes will be C. 
Anything further on this this morning? Thank you, Ron. Thank you all very much. I'll all right. Here. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.